it's not a rhetorical question. Can I do this in fourth? I'm soliciting uh, help, feedback and questions from the people joining um, uh, online and also from, from people on Twitch. So, so welcome. And yeah, I look, I look forward to hearing what you think. So, so what is this? What, is, what, what, what am I trying to do in fourth? The presentation is actually not in slides. It's on DocuWiki. And if you're interested, uh, I've typed it in the chat box. Um, but you can see just here, this is actually live on the internet. It's not the uh, most visited site in the world. But if you can see that, that's, um, that's where it is. So I'll, I'll announce the, the titles of the pages I'm on. And if the bandwidth constraints are too much, um, feel free, should you be interested, to take a look directly. So, so what's this? This is an image of the Orion Nebula um, taken with an amateur telescope and equipment from a local rooftop um, some time ago, November 2005. Um, I took the image myself, and um, this is um, what you get if you're interested in, in a hobby called astroimaging. Um, you use amateur equipment, amateur telescopes, and you need rather a lot of software. And it's the software elements that I'd like to, to talk about uh, this evening. And as I say, can I do it in fourth? So on to the next, on to the next slide where we'll talk about exactly what you need to, um, to obtain an image like this. OK, so I'll talk about the technicalities in a second. But why don't we start with some pictures, um, the brief guide to astroimaging. This is a, a, a small telescope. Um, and it is sitting on a computerized mount. You can see the mount here. What a computerized mount does is two things. It actually points the telescope at a place in the sky that you can um, specify through the interface. So you're sitting behind your PC. You can specify to go and point in this place or that place. There are different coordinate systems. And the telescope will use its servo motors to get there. And then most importantly, it will also track with the stars so, um, of course, as the sun rises and sets, the, sun's, the sun is moving through the sky throughout the day. The same is true, of course, of the stars. This is all due to the Earth's rotation. Um, it doesn't seem like much um, until you're magnifying. But when you're magnifying through a telescope, the stars can actually race through the eyepiece quite quickly. And if you're taking a picture, of course, you're taking a long exposure picture um, and you need everything to stay still. So you need the telescope to track. So that's what this computerized mount does. You also need to focus, and that's why you can see here we have a focusing wheel, but on the other side, you actually have a servo motor with a, um, a little interface there, DB9 interface, um, so you can also focus uh, using a computer application. Okay. Um, if you're interested, this is actually a 90 millimeter telescope, um, and um, it's, it's quite well suited for imaging because it doesn't, it doesn't color distort too much. Uh, it has a, um, a front lens made of fluorite rather than glass. Um, let's come down to a view here. This is all rather old-fashioned equipment. Um, you, you won't see this on sale anymore. It's it's kind of vintage, um, but it was my own equipment. Um, I um, I don't have it anymore. I, I gave it away when I moved homes to a place where you can't really see the sky too well, um, and, I, and I passed it along. But um, but this was the equipment I actually used. This is a CCD camera, so you can think of it as a digital camera without a shutter. And the critical thing about these cameras is that they're actually cooled. Because again, you're taking long exposure photographs. Um, I didn't explain that. But the idea is when you're taking a photograph of something which is actually dark, like the night sky, you need to run for quite a while to collect enough photons um, to be able to make out an image. Um, and so these are cooled, cooled cameras so that the background current, the dark current of the electronics inside the, the, C, the CCD um, is, is minimized, so there's actually cooling elements in here, so it's refrigerated by itself. Um, it's a black and white camera. Um, I've had a question before. This is black and white. And then here is a wheel that rotates. You can see a motor here, and again, a DB9 interface. It's a wheel that rotates different color filters, so red, green, blue, or some specialized narrowband filters um, in front of the camera. And so you take you take pictures in different colors, and then, and then we combine them later on. And uh, you can get a good view here of the focuser focus a wider as well. Uh, and this is the, if you're interested, it's a Takahashi Tema 2 mount. OK. And then what I wanted to show you is this. All of this is rather homemade. Um, it's the kind of hobby where you, what, the, the fun of assembling the equipment and making it work is, 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 the part of the fun is actually solving the problems and making it work and building the little gizmos you need to connect it all together. 
you can see here there's actually a box this is a usb cable which runs to a pc this cable used to run over the balcony down into the room below where i was sitting with the computer um, and then there's a usb hub here this is the robo focus which takes a usb input but then has the um, the output to the focus itself lots of power cables cameras cables to the camera cables to the mount cables to the filter wheel etc so it's a bit of a spaghetti and that, but that, that's how it's always done okay so I'm, I'm introducing this because i want to talk about the software i think it's necessary to have the hardware as a bit of a background but let's talk about the procedures um, and then we're going to get on and talk about the software and i'm going to talk about some of the applications and we'd like to discuss their their suitability uh, for being handled and forth and that's what this presentation is all about okay right so what does a typical evening at the telescope look like um, again, I'm going to run through in a little bit of detail. You don't need all this detail to, um, to think about the fourth elements, but it helps by way of background. So typically you have a mount, which is not that light, weighs 10 to 25 kilograms. Um, it's got big motors in it. Um, it goes on a big tripod or you may have a pier. Um, you need to polar align it. So the mount has two axes. You don't have them aligned horizontally and vertically. You have them aligned with the, the celestial north and south pole so that you if you want to track the stars as they turn over you you only need to motorize one mount one axis rather you need to motorize one axis and so you need to polar align the mount you need to make one axis point at polaris the pole star in the northern hemisphere there's a few ways of doing it um, some of these mounts including the one you just saw there has a little polar telescope built in you you peer through that and you can put polaris not in the centers of the crosshairs but in a little offset that will gain you within sort of two, not two minutes of time. This is, uh, so yeah, this is this is two. I mean, here two minutes of time. It will take you about two minutes to do that, and it's not especially accurate, but it's accurate enough for um, some of the images you saw, such as the one there. But wouldn't be very good for very high magnifications. You can do it an old-fashioned way using star drift in the eyepiece, and you make adjustments whether the star's drifting up or down as, as it crosses the eyepiece. It takes quite a bit of time and skill. Um, or these days, you can actually use the camera to take different pictures and then the, the, the pictures will be analyzed by software and it'll tell you to move move your axis up or down etc so once you've got your um, mount polar aligned you place the telescope you attach that filter wheel and camera and you connect all the electronic cables uh, that usually takes around about 20 minutes if you're practiced um, uh, but the thing is to make sure you don't miss anything out otherwise you get started and they, oh i haven't connected the filter wheel etc yeah, you end up wasting quite a lot of time so next stage startup um so there's usually um an overall scripting application on the pc that you are using to control this the setup this this rig um we'll talk more about that later um but that's the first thing you open and then through this scripting app application you connect the mount the focuser the filter wheel and the camera drivers and you take a test image and the reason you take a test image is you don't exactly know where your camera is pointing in the sky. You know roughly, because you pointed it there. But you do something called plate solving that we'll talk about later, which is where you take a picture. Um, and from the picture and the pattern of stars there, you can actually figure out where, where on Earth in the sky you're pointing. So you take the picture and plate solve to confirm the celestial coordinates. And then you synchronize the mount to those coordinates. And at this point, the mount is both calibrated and synchronized so that should you wish to move to another place in the sky, which of course you do, that's what you're going to do, start imaging. Um, you can just do it issuing commands at the keyboard or your scripting application more likely can issue commands to move the mount in time to start taking pictures. Okay, so that brings us nicely on to the imaging phase. Um, at the imaging phase, you, you have a target, right? So the target here was the Orion Nebula. And typically you might have one target for the whole night. It's, it's going to be something which is going to be rising in the evening, highest at midnight and going, to, going down in the, in the morning, in the early morning hours. And um, you'll probably need to, to have that target kind of in frame the whole night. You'll be taking more than one image. You'll be taking lots and lots of long exposure images and stacking them later, which we'll talk about. Um, but generally, it's kind of one target per night. So you salute to the target. You select a filter. Uh, it could be um, the um, luminescence, which is essentially a clear filter, uh, or red, green, or blue. You do an autofocus. Uh, focus is critical. Focus is absolutely critical to get a good image. Um, fortunately, stars are very good objects to focus on. 
Um, and so what will happen is your software typically, you could do it by hand, but your software typically will take various positions, will take various photographs with the focuser at different positions and will figure out how to focus. And you'll need to keep that focus updated during the night. You'll take a set of long exposure images, each one um, five, that would be um, pretty good, or as, as, as much as 15 minutes each. Um, the reason you don't take a single image of 12 hours is firstly, you probably couldn't. Um, the camera would saturate, certainly where the stars are, the camera would saturate, so you'd ruin the image. But also, you know, you're going to get a gust of wind, the mount is not perfect, it's going to deviate, so the, the stars are going to be, start looking like little trails, or an aeroplane is going to fly through, so you generally hedge your bets, and you, you break up the night into kind of short, maybe five, 15-minute intervals, um, where your mount is capable of holding its holding a star in, in position for that long. Um, and then you, 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 you stack them together at the end. And that has some statistical benefits as well. Um, periodically, you need to just double check that the mount is pointed to the right place. You plate solve and reslew to the target. Tracking errors avoided. And periodically, you also need to refocus. So what will happen is during the night, the temperature will change, generally dropping. So the, the, uh, the metal will contract. That will change the focus point. You need to adjust for that. There is also equipment flexors. So when you're when you're pointing near the horizon and when you're pointing up near the zenith, the point above, um, the point directly above us, obviously the, um, the the weight loading on the equipment is different. There may be flexure, and so that that also may require um, refocusing. Um, after the imaging run, so as we get towards dawn, um, the sun's going to be coming up soon. You can no longer photograph the Orion Nebula. You'll you'll need to take some calibration frames. Um, the first of these are dark frames. So if you've been um, taking images um, with um, five minute exposure times, what you want to do is you'll want to shut the shutter on the camera or you'll just cover the objective of the telescope and take a five minute image in the dark and you'll do several and average them. And this will enable you to sort of subtract out the, the inevitable dark current that the CCD camera has anyway, so that you, you can reduce your background consistent to what background is likely to be added in um, by the CCD electronics. Even though the cameras are cooled, there is always some dark current, but with the cooling, actually, it's, it's not too much. And then you will also take some flat frames against a uniform sky or against, you might put a, a white T-shirt over the objective. Those actually work quite well, because even though you may have uniform illumination at the front of the telescope at the objective, um, because of the way um, the, uh, the, object, the, um, uh, the optics um, are set up, inevitably, there will be more light reaching the very center um, of the um, CCD camera um, than there will be at the edges of, of that CCD chip inside the camera. And so that's actually, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a constant. This is called vignetting. Um, and you can actually divide it out by taking some pictures of a uniform or flat sky. Um, and then by dividing out, you can, you can, um, you can reverse that, um, that effect. And then there's image processing, and we'll see some of the specialized image processing software. Um, okay, so let me let me carry on and talk talk about what we're here for, which is the, um, the software. Right, these are the software components of a typical Astro imaging rig. Um, the first layer, the first layer is the hardware drivers. So the mount the focuser, the filter wheel, and the camera. There's, the, you saw boxes, you saw DB9 connectors, etc. You saw USBs. All of these have drivers um, which enable you to control them. The next thing is the scripting application. Why is there a scripting application? It, it would be complicated if you had to you know, send a command to the mount, then go and send a command to the focuser, find another application and, and adjust the filter wheel, then finally press the camera shutter, wait and do it again. You, you will be very busy. Not only that, but this is actually all happening at night and you may need to get some sleep. So people would always want to use a, a kind of scripting application, um, which is able to communicate with all of the different hardware through the drivers and can coordinate whatever plan you've set up, taking a, you know, slowing to the target, taking a variety of images through those different colors, um, maybe doing some quality checking, um, maintaining focus, and then eventually shutting down your equipment in the morning. Um, there are some specialized utilities that you need apart from just a motor driver 
you know, uh, hardware drivers and, and various uh, scripting applications to control them. Uh, you need something called FITS file handling. So FITS is, is kind of the JPEG of astronomy. It's the standard format for astronomical images. It's, it's not a compressed or lossy format, as you might imagine. Um, it was originally developed some time ago in, I, I don't know, some part of NASA, et cetera, but it's still used even in the amateur community for, for handling astronomical pictures and all the processing software uses that. So you need to be able to handle FITS files. You need to be able to do FITS plate solving that we'll talk about in a sec. You need to be able to do autofocus and you need to be able to schedule your targets, right? When do you line up on what target? How long do you run for, et cetera? That's, um, that's another issue. So let's, let's go through each of these in turn. And I want to explain a little bit more um, about each of these software components. Okay, so scroll down. Hardware drivers, fortunately, uh, operate through very standard interfaces. So um, there is a um, there is a standard. They call themselves ASCOM. I, I guess the A must be astronomy, and COM is um, probably referring to Windows COM because actually they appear as objects um, in in the Windows um, component object model. And this little diagram, which I've taken from ASCOM, it's a Creative Commons um, initiative. It's essentially uh, open source. Your astronomy application um, will interact through the interface for a telescope and there will be some various properties which it can query is the telescope slowing that means is it moving is it tracking that means is it actually turning that one axis so that the uh, camera stays aligned with the stars that's tracking you can turn tracking on or off and what location where does the telescope think it's pointing at the moment those are some properties. You also have some methods. You can pass some coordinates and ask the telescope to slew to those coordinates. Um, and you can tell it whether it should track or not. And actually tracking, you can track the stars, you can track the moon, you could track at a slightly different rate if there's a comet, because a comet moves at a slightly different rate compared to the background stars, right? So you have some, you have some methods and properties in the telescope interface. And each different mount manufacturer, so there are three mount manufacturers illustrated schematically here, they will have a different, um, uh, you know, a di essentially different uh, software in the in the mount itself. Um, but but how how that software runs and exactly what the interface to that software is, we don't need to worry about because they will provide a driver in the form of one of these COM objects, one of these ASCON COM objects that provides exactly the same interface. Um, and so that's how that's how we solve the problem of hardware drivers. Um, and and ASCOM is quite mature. It's been running probably for, I don't know, uh, 15, 20 years. It's quite mature. It, it, it works. So, so no problem with the ASCOM drivers. So that's how the hardware, I've spoken about telescope here, but the filter wheel um, is done in the same way. Um, the focus done in the same way. There are also ASCOM drivers for cameras, but you can imagine with the amount of data coming down from a camera and say a 50 megabyte image, um, there are also native drivers for the cameras. And so sometimes the astronomy application will skip, will skip using the ASCOM interface and just have a native interface to the camera um, to get finer control and also for, 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 for better efficiency. Right. Okay. So the next, the next item in the list of software components was a scripting engine. And probably it's easier if I show you one of the very simplest scripting engines I ever, one of the simplest scripting applications I ever saw. Um, this was this was what I actually wrote myself around about um, 2004 and maintained it through about 2007. Um, I'll just take you to the screen because by, by doing this, you can kind of see what, what's going on. You, you connect to the camera, the telescope and the focuser. Um, you can start, stop or pause operations. Um, you have some way of deciding what your target is, you give it a file name, there's a place um, you can specify. Right ascension is essentially like um, longitude in the sky. Declination is essentially like latitude in the sky. You can tell it what time to start, what time to stop. So that's how long your imaging runs going to last. Um, there are various technical details here. You can control the focusing here. Um, and then when you're wrapped up, do you want to park the scope? Will you do those calibration frames I mentioned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was a little scripting application which interfaced through those, those COM objects. 
And then um, there's always a second part, which is the images that you want to take. So um, I'm going to be taking four sets of images here. I've enabled four slots, red, green, blue, and then that luminescence, which is essentially UVIR. You, you, you generally want to block um, the regions that the camera is not sensitive to. Um, it just tends to cause flooding. It's, it's not helpful. This was going to be three minute explosions. Um, and again, this was the, the suffix for the file name, et cetera. And you can see how, and then there's some, there's some smaller details towards um, focusing, et cetera, and some offsets because there's a different light travel path. So you might adjust your, your focuser in between uh, different color frames. So this is kind of, the, this was actually, it was, it was on the internet. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a, I believe it was a popular download in its time. I made it freeware, um, but things have come along a lot. And this is a, a modern uh, semi-professional application um with drag and drop scripting it's called voyager it's it's the software costs i don't know a few hundred euros um which is expensive but not crazily expensive compared to the cost of some of the equipment um and you know it's 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 you can see it's it's vastly more sophisticated than than um than, than things were in those early days so yeah there are commercial scripting applications available such as this one Okay, carrying on to uh, some of the specialist software. So I mentioned FITS files. So here we go. Uh, FITS files, the standard format, they are approved by the, in, yeah, revisions are approved by the IAU, which is the International Astronomical Union. And here you can see a, a piece of software called MaxMDL, which is, um, yeah, again, it's, uh, it's 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 one of these. It's an it's an alternative alternative scripting engine that also does a bit of image processing, and you can see it's got the same image, uh, the the two thousand five the November two thousand five Orion ne Nebula open, in its original fit file format. This is a color stack. It's not one of the original frames that I took of the telescope. It, it's what you get after you add all the images together through the different color channels, and you can see that one of the things fit files have is a lot of headers. Um, that disc, you know, things like the exposure time, um, what the the object right ascension. Remember, that's the celestial longitude, the object declination, the celestial um, latitudes. So this is actually the coordinates of the Orion Nebula, the, the observing site, etc. So a lot of a lot of um, um, a lot of detail there. The FITS format is actually quite complicated. It is it is a fairly complicated standard. It wasn't it wasn't designed to be user friendly. It's grown since 1976, um, and we'll talk later about how you get access to to libraries that might might help you do that. There are libraries in C plus plus, C sharp, Fortran, Java, Python, and other languages. This is a list of them, but I didn't find any in fourth. Um, at least at least not as far as I was I was looking. Okay, so that's that's handling FITS files. That's one of the things you've got to be able to do if you want to to write software and if you want to control control your um, uh, your astro imaging rig. So we go on to plate solving, um, and plate solving is the the formal the formal word for plate solving is astrometric calibration of an image. Right. So here is an image, and this is an application i haven't used it myself but it's a well-respected application called astap and what astap does it has actually identified all the stars in the image and it has compared them against a reference catalog and by shuffling things around actually it doesn't do it matching star by star it tends to make polygons of the stars it tends to hash the polygons and then try and mat, uh, match the hash codes um but by 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 doing that it's able to tell you exactly where this camera is pointing at the time this image was taken. You need to give it a rough starting point, which is which is something that's possible, but then it will tell you exactly where you're pointing. And it's necessary to have that, that degree of alignment because obviously when you want to go and image your target, you, you want to accurately align on the target and, and synchronize to that, that point in the sky. And so you need to be able to have access to, to plate solving software um, and this one is actually uh, it can be called by the, by the command line, so you can interface with it from the com command line. Um, and there are others. Um, Pinpoint's another one, which is also scriptable via uh, by, by Windows com. So again, this is one of the things you have to be able to interact with if you're if you're thinking of writing software for controlling some of these um, some of these processes. Uh, if we carry on to autofocus, so sharp focus is critical for 
quality images. I've explained that you need to refocus during the night. This is a, a piece of software called Focus Max, which runs as a plugin to other things like script and scripting applications. What it's done here, position. These are essentially positions of the focuser. I don't think there's any, any units on this. It's just uh, an, arbitrary, an arbitrary scale. And HFD, this is the half flux diameter of a star. So although a star essentially is, is a pinpoint object as viewed from Earth, when, when um, due to diffraction effects, when you image it on the CCD, you will actually get a circle. Um, and the width of that circle will depend on, among other things, how well focused the, the star is. You won't be able to get it down to a pinpoint, but if you take it out of focus, that, that, that the width of that star image will increase. They don't measure the whole width of the star. It's hard to determine where the boundary is. And so it's actually much better to measure the, the radius at which you contain half the flux of that star image. And what this has done is this, this application is, is shown that the half flux diameter is 40 pixels if you're at this point in the focuser or at this point in the focuser. And it's actually got a relatively linear curve. Um, and then there's a hyperbola. It generally follows a hyperbola. So it's been able to tell you that the focus should be at the position 2,501. So it'll take a bunch of pictures um, and then it'll move your, your focus at the position 2,501. And you will, you will have the best possible focus that you can have at, at that moment. So auto focusing is another is another software job that, that's got to be done. Okay. And then lastly, target scheduling. Um, you know, there are lots of uh, there are lots of factors to bear in mind when you're thinking about what you're going to take a picture of and when. Clearly, it's got to be above the horizon. Um, but that's not the only point. It needs to get it needs to get high enough in the sky. That you're going to be clear of kind of the the low level atmospheric dirt that you know, the, the sky glow from nearby towns and cities or even the town and city that you're in um so you want to you want to image something that's quite high up in the sky so you you look at a graph like this which tells you you know when it when it's high this is the time this is the altitude um but other things are relevant like the moon if you if you image something that's close to the moon it's going to be flooded with moonlight and actually, you're going to lose a lot of contrast and, and you won't capture the, the fine details, for example, of a nebula cloud. And so all of these things, this is actually an online um, an online tool. But there, there, are, there is no target scheduling software really for amateur astronomers that actually works really well. Um, but there are various websites, as I say, planetarian applications that can assist with manual scheduling. In other words, picking out what, what you would like to image at what time. Um, it would be nice if there was better software, and this is one of the things that I would like to to, to develop some, to to spend some time thinking about, and, and possibly um, see what I can come up with. Okay, so let's talk about what I think the problem is, and what the the opportunity is. Okay, so having shown you all that, having shown you what the um, uh, what's got to be done, I still think there's room for improvement in the software available for controlling amateur telescopes. So some of those, those screenshots I showed you are actually commercial software, but they're all quite dated and expensive. I mean, there's a small market, um, mainly saying, I mean, I think, it, yeah, their market is fairly small um, because it's expensive. Um, they're not selling to, to new people these days. Um, the open source options, and there are quite a few, they're very similar in style and limitations. They tend to be monolithic because everyone wants to contribute. They've got feature bloat. The interfaces are very picky. You need to click this. You need to click that. You need to put something in there. If you get any of it wrong, it's not going to work out the way you're expecting. You probably won't get anything at all. Um, but again, the trouble with open source and everybody contributing is often it's, the leadership isn't that clear. And so these things can be a bit messy. Um, the one outstanding offering, Voyager, um, which is like a screenshot, is it's kind of idiosyncratic. It is very, very good. It's, it's been written by an Italian. Uh, amateur, uh, or I think he's a professional programmer, but an amateur astronomer. Um, it has no documentation. Um, I said minimal, um, but essentially, it's, there's the documentation has been provided by users. Um, some have, and, and you know, Voyager was one example. They've got like a scratch-like um, graphical scripting, so you can, you know, scratch the computer language. You can drag and drop elements, like take a picture, move my telescope, etc. But they're not scriptable from outside the application. So if you wanted to sit down at a terminal or with a text file and actually craft something a little bit more complicated, you can't really do that. You're limited to some sort of quite high level building blocks. 
Um, and some features I still think aren't that well executed. Um, for example, the target scheduler. You, 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 you can't really find a good target scheduler on, on some of the Samantha software, which means that you will have to be there at the time you want to image and you'll need to you know, work everything out on the night. You may be busy, you may not have time for all of this. You can't fully automate. You can't fully automate that first step of even you know, picking the right target for the right night. Um, at the same time, this is actually quite a popular hobby. Um, things are things are advancing, right? So electronics, especially cameras and computerized mounts are advancing rapidly, but whilst becoming less expensive. Um, and some of the world's best observing sites are now available to amateurs through commercial remote ho hosting. So even if you live in a place where you can't see the moon, you can go to one of these places. This is a place in Chile run by um, some guys to, to French gentlemen and a, and a Chilean. Um, this is where the European Union places the European, um, a very large telescope, the VLT, um, and the European uh, Space Observatory is here as well. It's, it's on a mountain top over there. It's something like 1,700 meters. It's in the Chilean desert. And all of these, all of these mounts actually belong to, well, they're rented by um, the owner of the telescopes. And it's, I, I can't say it's um, a free hobby, but it's it's within within the realms of possibility. It's certainly it's certainly cheaper than expensive automobiles or boats or something like that. Um, and so you can send your telescope off to a place like this. They'll host it for you, and you can control it over the internet. And so the opportunity you have for um, for taking pictures of the night sky is, is tremendous. And it, it would be good to have uh, software which is which is up to taking the fullest advantage of that opportunity. Um, and that that's where I'm coming from with this talk. Um, so that brings me on to what what role for fourth, right? Where where can we fit fourth into some of this? Given there is there is still work to be done, the software isn't yet perfect. Um, the hardware drivers are, are prepared by the manufacturers. They're actually regularly updated. They get all the feedback from the full user base. Interfaces according to well developed and mature ASCON standards. So I don't think anybody is is too concerned about the hardware drivers. That that seems like the right way of solving that problem. Um, a scripting application, I think there's there's plenty of room for a better scripting application, um, but you require access to libraries. I, you can't develop a scripting application unless you can handle FIT files. If you can interface with COM objects, you need some sort of object orientation, at least for handling those COM objects. You need some sort of GUI, or perhaps you could think about doing it with a web interface. And you need some sort of image statistical analysis, right? So you're going to need to run numerical routines. Because for that autofocus, you've got to measure the heart flux diameter of the stars. You've got to find them. So you know you need you need libraries that can do this. It would take a long time, I think, to develop them all from scratch. Um, and also a new target scheduler that would be a very exciting project. At least at least uh, I think so. You would want to eliminate all those error-prone GUI settings and use some real stuff, right? Maybe SQLite to manage target lists and configurations. And so you'd need all those libraries, and then you'd actually want um, some um, libraries for some sophisticated celestial coordinate math for basically working out where the moon is, where your targets are, what's going to optimize the separations, etc. Um, and and you'll need the libraries for for SQLite. So that's kind of what I was looking at when I was thinking about whether I could do this in fourth. And it, it's quite a big ask, right? If you want all access to all these libraries, um, that is a big ask. I was looking around, and and, and what, what I found to my surprise is that Tickle actually has all of it which is really interesting. So there's a long history of Tickle being used in professional observatories. Um, there are many, many of those libraries, including SQLite, of course, which is coming from the same same creators uh, or the same group of people that, that care about Tickle. Um, or they're one step away in C. Um, and actually, I found this app, which is called our Daila. It's, a, it's actually a scriptable. You can write Tickle code to run um, to run your astro imaging, the, the, the GUI is perhaps not as polished as some of them, um, but it's a t t tickle TK interface that you can customize, and you can write tickle code to, to do everything that I was dreaming of, of, of writing much more finely tuned scripts and um, perhaps even even a scheduler. So there, that that was a really interesting find um, that that a lot of this is already going on in, in tickle, and. So I was thinking, you know, the discussion is, and, and where I would be appreciating some advice or thoughts or um, suggestions is, you know, surely if ever there was an application made for fourth, wouldn't it be astro imaging? You know, fourth was invented for controlling a radio telescope by Chuck Moore. 
Um, I know that Leon and, and Fourth Inc are actually controlling radio dishes right now with Fourth. You know, it's very fourth like that we've got professional professionals and amateurs working together. Um, you know, the, the technical aspects you know, are very similar to the kind of technical aspects that, that fourth gets involved with motor controllers running through to something that are much more sophisticated. And, and there is a real need for, for fourth quality engineering. Some of this, some of the software applications, you know, what happens is you, you, you wake up in the morning and you find your telescope pointing at the ground and sort of the motors have been trying to push it through the to push it through the tripod because there was a bug and and this is you know this is where fourth quality engineering under the hood would be of great practical benefit um yeah i don't think the case for fourth is is really compelling you know it's hard to find any recent history um which is perhaps because this is an esoteric application but all those libraries would have to be plumbed in from nothing even sql light um there's a lot of applications, a lot of numerical applications that need to be implemented from the textbook. You, you really don't want to be inventing, reinventing celestial mechanics. You just you want to type in the formulas from the from the textbook. This is this is well understood stuff, um, and that's not the easiest thing to do with with reverse Polish notation. And so I'm wondering what is the right approach for using the fourth. And I think this project perhaps is illus illustrative of other projects or other application areas, so that it's um, a discussion. Um, perhaps has um, wider applicability. You know, what's what's the right way? Do I embark on some sort of fairly long bottom-up project to develop a stack of um, astronomy-related data structures and libraries, you know, like Handley Fitz files? Um, do I try and use the fourth as some sort of glue language, like Rex was or, um, uh, or Arex on the Amiga? Um, do I do it in Tickle, but then um, perhaps use Wolf uh, Wygaard's Tickle fourth? on top, although the question occurs, if you're doing it all in Tickle, why do you need the fourth on top? I want to talk to, uh, to Wolf, although he wasn't able to be here, and uh, Uli has, has kindly um, uh, arranged for us to, to have a chat. So that, that's great. I'd be interested to hear what Wolf thinks and, and what his motivations are for Tickle Fourth. Um, or is, is the role of fourth really just like a niche tool for doing small scale problem solving? Maybe you want to build a little box. It's going to has like some sort of GPS in it to feed this or that or a temperature reader or something. And so you're only going to use fourth on the local hardware level. Um, those are some of the questions and uh, that I'm struggling with. And um, yeah, so that's the um, that's the discussion that I would be interested to have um, both now and, um, and continuing. So I'll, I'll stop sharing at this point. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, any questions? And, oh, right away, Gerald, please. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. As a matter of fact, I was interested in just obtaining a telescope and doing just that. <laughs> so I know where to start now. Uh, can I ask you a very stupid question? Uh, how to get started, you know? I mean, what's the minimum viable telescope, so to say? So here's the insight. There's no such thing as a minimum vi viable telescope. There is such a thing as a minimum viable mount. You can almost image through a Coke bottle as long <laughs> as your mount is absolutely rock steady. Okay. And actually, you can, just, you can just put a lens. You can just use a camera lens, and you'll get wonderful wide views of the whole sky, and you can decide what interests you. But if your mount is not rock steady, you will end up, uh, disappointed and bleary-eyed most mornings after attempting to take pictures of things which just fall over, drift out of focus. Mm. And, and so you need to start with a high-quality mount, of which there are there are many. Unfortunately, it's the most expensive part of the whole setup. And it doesn't make sense mount, to build that yourself? You can't make your own mount. It has okay. sophisticated things, encoders. I mean, look, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it is. it, it needs... To, it's been done before and it's going to be cheaper, faster just to buy something that's being offered by other people. There are a lot coming from the Far East and the quality is pretty good. Korean, mm -hmm. Chinese mounts, some of the quality, the Japanese ones are good but expensive. Some of the European mounts, 10 micron, etc., are also good. But you start with a mount. So that's my advice in, in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. And maybe can I just recommend, because you said re-implementing everything, maybe take the glue approach and just use the C libraries. And you, there are C interfaces for almost any force by now. And if you need help with that, just let me know. We can make it uh, run through SWIG, which is really easy. And I Thank think- Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. So C interfaces, you'll, you'll go with C interfaces and, and try and glue it together with fourth. And, and maybe then way, add something, like when Krishna has his numerical FSL stuff, uh, 
you know, uh, propped up, you replace these items then with pure force, I guess. But yeah, that's just my two cents. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Thank you. So next question by Krishna, please. Yes, I, I, several years ago, I developed a, a, a interface to the C bits IO library that's published by NASA. And I put the link to that code and that's that's li a library specific interface to k-fourth but uh it can be adapted for other fourths i'm not sure that it's up to date because that was so long ago and i'm sure the library has changed since then but uh it 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 will certainly work with the version of the bits io library that uh that's mentioned there. Thank you, Krishna. Okay. I'm going to have to update my talk. I said this hasn't been done too much in fourth, but it has. But I only found out after I presented it to you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think is as far as the spherical astronomy calculations go, it shouldn't be hard to code that in fourth. Uh, you know, there, I remember a um, uh, small book that was published back in the 80s, it was spherical astronomy for a pocket calculator. And, uh, and I remember coding those into or programming a TI-59 calculator with a lot of those uh, routines. But it, I think those should be probably yeah, fairly easy to do in fourth. Um, so those, those two components, I think, won't be too much of a problem. But, uh, I should mention that, that Leon was actually kind enough to share some some fourth routines for calculating um, what's called astronomical time. Um, you know, we yeah. convert hours, minutes, and seconds into a into a single uh, floating point number, right. which you can date. And he's been kind enough to share some routines. So there are some starting points out there. Yeah, yeah, but it, it is there's going to be a considerable amount of work to do to to have that code available and for it. Um, is the other the other thing I was going to mention was uh, in response to Gerald's uh, query about what kind of telescope. Yes, uh, I concur with Andrew and, and everybody else. Well, the pointing is the problem, holding the telescope pointed at uh, a particular point in the sky and tracking uh, that, that point, that position is the fundamental problem in astrophotography. Uh, the optics you know, the, using a Newtonian telescope like I use is the only optical element that's involved. Well, there's two, but the only uh, focusing element is a, a one mirror, and the other thing is a flat folding mirror to, to point it out of the telescope tube. Uh, so everything else is the camera and the the quality of the mount. That's it. They say put the money mirror. in the mount. That's the catchphrase, yeah. right? Put the money in the mount. Yes. Don't worry about saving anything for the uh, for the telescope. And actually, the cameras are not that expensive, and you can use your own camera that you already have. You can, you can use a DSLR camera to start with if you want. Yes. So John Helmers did have a question, but he lowered his hand. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing about the equations, but. Um, but uh, maybe you can save money, I don't know, by renting that mount in Chile. What do you think? So the way those guys work, um, um, they, you send your own equipment. You, they, so they, what they supply is a, is a steel pier, which is about seven foot high um, with a mounting plate. And you send them a, um, a box of, um, you, send, you send them a box of equipment, you send them a box of equipment on a crate and they will put it on there for you, help you keep it running. Um, so you can you can send them whatever you like. It's not just the guys in Chile. There are people in, in doing it in Arizona. There are people doing it in Spain. Anyway, Western Australia. Interestingly, Chile works really well for me. My equipment's currently in a crate. which should arrive in a few days, actually, um, because it's 12 hours away from my time zone. And so staying up all night in Chile is is just like taking a day off for me, which which helps because I like I like my sleep. So um, uh, I have a comment um, about the history. It's not just that um, Chuck Moore so forth was early in, in the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, but also I, I think there was uh, some time in the 70s 
Forth was very popular in astronomy and uh, uh, it was some people were using it as uh, proposing it as a standard language or it was the standard language or something like that. Um, so that at some time uh, ago. The original full standard, 477, was developed by the astronomy industry. Oh, wow. I need, I need to go back a lot further. This has been really enlightening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Krishna has another question. Uh, this is a comment. Uh, Andrew, are you familiar with the website astrometry.net? You can upload a picture to it and they will plate solve it for you. And, That's uh, right. I am familiar with that. So you can send it up. That place in Chile, they have, they have satellite internet, um, satellite or microwave. Um, you have um, 100 megabits up. Uh, download. I'm quite not quite sure what the upload is, um, mm. and it's all powered by solar. There's all it's all solar powered with batteries. So you have to be thoughtful about the way you use the internet when you're on one of those remote places. But yes, but thank you for that that tip. Yeah, the software that powers astronomytree.net is open source, and it can be uh, run locally on your machine. Uh, I haven't tried to build it on mine, but uh, but basically you can send them any. A picture for you know you don't have to tell it anything about what you're looking at or where you're looking in the sky or how wide your field of view is it will determine what you're looking at and label all the features in your image and if put the want, coordinate data. yeah if you want to plate solve within 10 seconds you can give it a good guess but if you're willing to wait two minutes and you really don't know you want to save your telescope wherever it's pointing then you could take that longer approach i think but it could take a few sure. minutes Final short question by Gerald. Oh, short. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, oh. hey, I'll, I'll make it yeah. short. Um, I was imagining all of this running on a Raspberry Pi. Is this completely crazy because you need a much more beefy computer or does it just take longer? You wouldn't use a Raspberry Pi. There are some companies that are actually developed really clever single board computers that actually integrate all of these scripting and controls with a little bit less flexibility than you'd have it, have it, have it with a desktop. Um, so I'm going to send you a link. Um, actually, maybe you could put it on, uh, um, uh, Mother put it on, put it on the Twitch. I'll, I'll, I'll Twitch, put, yeah. give you a link to a rather interesting box. We won't advertise it now, but essentially for Raspberry Pi plus accessory kind of money, you can buy something which is already re ready purposed. Wonderful answer. Thank you. <laughs>